Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us, a beautiful day and this time together. And Lord, as we get into your word and keep studying it, it moving forward in the conversation, Lord, just be in the conversation, Lord. Be in everything that's said and done. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the things we've learned and how we applied it to our lives, Lord. There's so many things that we're looking at. So as we get in this tonight, we just put it into your hands. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And we may get past this tonight, okay? I don't know how long this is going to take. And I got lesson 23, uh, chapter 23 right back there just in case we need it. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to finish up with Genesis 22. And it's amazing how the whole storyline changed, okay? The whole thing about Isaac and laying him on the altar and that whole storyline. And verse 19 of 22 it ends, says, So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. In the next verse, it begins to talk about Abraham's family through his brother Nahor. And now it came to pass after these things that it was told, Abraham saying, Indeed, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor. And then it gets on all of these names, okay? And we're going to go through that tonight as we take a look at this. this. These verses are kind of a precursor of what we're going to do in chapter 25 when we get there, when Isaac takes his wife, okay? And so all these names have a purpose. I mean, God just didn't put them in there for the fun of it. And there's a story in the names. And so... As you look at this, and we begin to look at what's there, and, and just kind of think it through, it, there's some amazing parallels that, that's taking place here, okay? And so, it came to pass that after these days, it was told Abraham, saying, indeed, Milcah has also borne children to your brother Nahor, okay? Now, in this time period, Abraham had two kids. Ishmael and Isaac. In that same time period, Abraham's brother had 12 kids, 12 sons. And that's an amazing parallel, isn't it? Yeah. And what we know is going to happen down the line, you're going to end up with how many tribes? 12. 12. And Nahor has 12 boys, eight by his wife and four by his concubine. And so we're going to take a look at that tonight. So actually I'll go with the list too, just to be able to to do this. And I'm trying to balance all of this. I need a double, I need a third hand. No, I'm okay. I'm okay. So Milka, his wife. So that would be Abraham's sister-in-law. Milka means queen. Her name, she was the queen of that house, okay? Now, Nahor, that's a funny name, okay? Can you imagine naming your kids Nahor, and the word means snorting? No. <laughs> it's like he snorted, did he snort when he laughed? I mean, yeah, snorting, or, or horse. The idea of dry throat, horse sounding. He, ha he was making noises, but, I mean, that's what his name claims. Well, maybe maybe he was uh, making snorting sounds when he was born. I don't know. So they named him Nahor. Did they, did they name their kids right at birth? Or yeah, they're naming it. They don't know. Well, some they were a little bit, but not huh. not, not that okay. long. Not years and years. Oh, they're not pretty well named at birth. Okay. All right. Or eight days, right? Yeah, there's within the, the little window there. Um, so they had, those two had kids. The snorting husband with the queen. And they, their firstborn is Huz. Now it's funny that the names, that they're, they're not pronounced the same way, but if we were like just in English, we would read that in verse 21. Huz is firstborn and Buzz his brother. Huz and Buzz. <laughs> but it's not pronounced that way. It's Huz is the first one, but the second one is Booze. Yeah, it's pronounced Booze. Like alcohol, huh? And so, Huz's name is Council. Remember, he has this idea of that, you know, he's smart, and they went to him. Booz was a, a man of contempt. 
and they have these, all these different things that are going on, okay? Kemuel, and this is an amazing one, Kemuel, remember the L means God, so God has raised up or God has established, Kemuel, and they deviate in the line. <clears throat> That's what we're talking about. Because Kemuel, instead of going on to the next child, it says there, Kemuel was the father of Aram. Now that's a form of the word. Before he became Abram, Abraham, he was Abram, Aram. The root word, the root of both of these names, you would say, Father of multitudes. The time he had these names, he was didn't have any kids yet. Okay, so you have it's in that root word. It's part of his name, but all. As you look this up, all theologians and those that have studied into this stuff, their first saying of that word is not father of multitudes. They do say that he is that. But they all say that word is a form of the word which we know as the country, Syria. Now I find that a little amazing. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you talk of Aram, is that mm -hmm. where the Aramean tribes come from? That's what I'm getting ready to talk about. Okay. Yeah. So, we know the words from Aram. Huh? Aramean. Huh? Aramean. Armenian? All of those words are a form of this word. And even in the language of Jesus' time, remember that in Jesus' time, they spoke Aramaic. It was a blend of Hebrew. And it was Aramaic. And he calls it out in the Old Testament here that points out that Kemuel, and Kemuel was, God has raised up or God has established for the purpose that, and the next thing you know, and he has a son, which in this line isn't a brother to Nahor, but it's his grandson. He deviates, okay, so as he's ejecting that into the, into, the, into the list that's going on here. So, so you have Huz is firstborn, Booz is brother, Kemuel, the father of Aram, Chesed. Now that's amazing. They, all through the back, I, I, I started to do a list, I thought, no, I'll, get, I'll go off on a tangent, we'll be there all night. That word is used a lot. That word chested. And a lot of times in some of the Old Testament passages, when it's talking about God, it's the chested God or the loving kindness of God. Yeah. That, it, that name, most of the time, translated as points to God. Okay? And they named this child loving kindness. Maybe he was a, he was a good kid, I guess, huh? You know, hopefully he lived up to his name. Yeah, they hope he lived up to his name, and that's what you assume. Because do well, they live up to all these yeah, names? Yeah, names mean something. Yeah, they named them the words. So did they turn out like that? Yeah. We can them? never totally know. All we can know is the story behind the name. Right. But do you remember when we did in Genesis the whole line that went from Adam to Methuselah, and every name had a meaning and. Yeah. Right. You remember when we did that? And it, had, it actually had a gospel message in through all those names. That was right. put into the Bible over hundreds, if not a close to a thousand year time period. Well, and they all seemed to live up to the names, except for like, and then, or they got renamed later, God renamed them. Well, look at even Jacob. Yeah. His name was a deceiver. Right. And he was. He was. And then he became the prince with God, Israel. Yeah, I mean, we can't totally figure that out. But yeah, I kind of believe that they did live up to their names. That's why they're part of the story. And some of these names that you're seeing right here, did you find that? You are, that's so good. You are too good. Yeah, here's the list. You went Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, 
Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Okay? That's a long time period from Adam to Noah. Okay? And here's the names. Adam meant man. Adam. Dom. Dom meant man. Adam. Okay? Seth. So here's, <coughs> I'm just going to read the same. Man, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. There's the line. The meaning of their names was this. Man appointed mortal sorrow. The blessed God shall come down teaching. His death shall bring the despairing rest and comfort. That is, you can't make this stuff up. Huh? No. That, that was all written, and all these parents, and if you'd ask every one of those parents, they'd say, I named that child. Now there's a whole other conversation. I, I thought about it, and I named my child. <laughs> Do you believe it? I think God named those children. Huh? Yeah, they said it, right? They put the idea in their head, this is what they named them. Exactly. And you know what? That same thing happens in our own lives. We think we do yes. things. Oh, I did this. And we really did. God was moving us all along. Huh? Even when we named Thank our children. Still to this day. But that's, that's amazing how this all through the Word of God, is, that, that story, you see glimpses of this all through this. And what I started to say, there's, come, there's several of these names that in these children that's being named here is the only time that they're mentioned in the Bible ever. There's no more to them. There's no more, nothing said about them. But they made the book, huh? There's a part for the story. So, Chesed. Then you have Hazel. Hazel prophesied. It is a prophetic ministry. Don't know. But God, his name was really prophesying. He foretold the, the idea of being able to speak forth the mysteries of God and all these names, okay? Then you have Pildash. It's the idea, of, well, you have the idea, it's also steely, but captive, this idea of where it is Pildash. Is we would use the word steely, that's why, I guess he's just, how, I don't even know how else to describe that. Steel spine? You know, as a man that wasn't going to be pushed around. So you have the one that's steely, and then you have Jidlaf. Jack, you can't, oh, you got your hands full? No. Look, look up Job 16.20. Because that word, his name, is also a part of that verse. And his name, so you have one that's steely, and the other one to drop or to drip. Now, isn't that a crazy name to name your child? Okay. And so, we get a glimpse of it. There was a few others I could have used, but I thought, no, that, that's a good enough one to kind of make the point of what was going on. Job 16, 20. Yes. Uh, my friends scorn me, my eyes pour out tears to God. Mm -hmm. That's translated, my eyes pour out tears to God. And that, but that word is his name. To drop a group. So you have one that's steely, and the other one's a crybaby, I guess. Huh? Or had, maybe he had a heart for the things of God. And he cried out for others. You know, I'm just being a little fun. But yeah, so that's what his name meant. So it meant kind of like weep? Weep, yeah, the idea. But it's literally, translates literally to drop or to drip. You think, what? And then when you, when you gave a reference of where the word was used, it was to weep. And the same idea. We're going to see a couple more like that. Okay, and so we have, and it's going to, it does it again. What he did with, uh, what he did with Kemuel and pointed to a grandson. The next one is Bethuel. Now, this is very interesting. This one. We know this one, right? Huh? We're in the storyline, we're going to hit it again when we get further down the road. But remember in the story of Jacob at Bethel? Huh? And he woke up and he named the place Bethel. Because Beth means... You remember? House. It's house of God. There you go. L means God. Translate literally, house God. We would say house of God. But when you put the U in there, 
you change the whole meaning. And they're close because it's, it's still house of God, but Beth U, Beth U L, I got the U, I got the U in the wrong spot. There we go. Beth U L, the closest translations we can get is the idea of being in the house with God. So what the best translation would be, well, of God. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? And it's funny, out of all these kids, there's eight of them, eight boys named there. Count down the list, and skip the, make sure you skip the grandson, because you're thinking, no, there's one too many in the name. Okay, remember Aram's? Aram is the grandson, not, he's not the son, okay? You're down to Bethuel, out of those eight kids, Bethuel, the Bible makes a point to point it out, the one that was a dweller with God. With is the better word. Dweller with God. And the one that dwelt with God produced the daughter by the name of Rebecca. Now that, that is amazing. Huh? Out of all the names and all the craziness and all the meanings of stuff that they did. And what's eight mean again? Huh? Is there significant on the eight? Yeah, what's eight? Confusion or no. What? New beginnings. New beginnings. Yeah, new beginnings. Okay, back off. Yeah, no, no, I'm here. You kind of got it. The eight is new beginnings. New beginnings. But he had four more boys. Mm -hmm. huh? Now, there's an also amazing fact that you see here. Talk about Nahor's concubine. Her name was Ruma. This is the first time in Scripture that a lady is addressed as a concubine. Now in our culture, in that it is a part of the definition, we don't use that word anymore. People would probably you know, be you know, stoning you and say, oh, you're a concubine. You'd be punching in the face, okay? But the idea of a concubine in its perfect translation is living with a male whom you're not married to. In the polygamy cultures, the, con the, fir the, the first wife, the one he's married to, is the wife. And if he takes on more than one wife, it's kind of the same thing. Have you ever watched those polygamy shows on TV? I mean, that's, it, it's kind of that same idea. That's where, they, that's where they get that from. So the second or third wife are, they don't call them sister wives, but they're inferior wives to the queen. In other words, the queen's in control. But these are other wives that are, have a less state standard, and that they're called concubines, okay? And so, but, it's funny that her name, in this whole thing, Ruma, you know, she is a concubine. She's an inferior wife to Milka. But this concubine's name means exalted. Raised up. <laughs> yeah, you may be the queen, but I'm the one that's been exalted here. You think that could be some trouble between those two women? I'm with it, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but did the queen, did not, not know her? Okay. No, that was her name when he took her. See, it's funny how these names are paralleling the story. Yeah, and that was her name. And he took her as the second wife, or the inferior wife, which in, in the polygamy of that time, they say concubine. Okay, <clears throat> you know, we don't use that word anymore. And the concubine gave him four more sons. To Ba, now here's the, this is an amazing one. If you just stopped at the first little part of that, you could say, ooh. To Ba, the, the straight translation of that 
is murder. <laughs> okay? But you read on, and they, oh, that guy's a murderer. It also says, you can that's used with the word butchery. Well, I guess you could use that as still killing, saying so he's the butcher, huh? Huh? But it also means to cook. Maybe he was the one that killed the animals and he was the chef. See, you gotta read it, you gotta study it through because if you just stop the first line, and that is the literal translation straight across is murder. Murder. Or you, you dig into the words and how it plays out, and, and all of a sudden it says it also means butchery, to cook. Well, that changes everything when you hear that to cook, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> big difference. Yeah, big difference. So the next one after him was Gahan. I don't know. <laughs> murder him to cook him. <laughs> yeah, murder him and cook him. <laughs> Jeffrey Dahmer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Gahan is the next one. Okay. That's a form of the word. The last three is Ham, one of the sons of Noah, uh -huh. which literally translates hot. Okay. Gaham is the idea of heat bursting forth. Maybe he had a, a very eruptive, heated personality. Hit the right button and he would just burst forth. I don't know. But it, it gives you some insights. And so you have the. The hash, this was the quiet son, to keep it silent. And macha means bruised or crushed. So that's the four more boys, which gave him a total of now what? Twelve. Twelve. See, there's, there's stories and even all the numbers. What's four? You got the four sons of Bruma. Four is what? What's the number four step for? Number of creation. Yes. That's the earth, wasn't it? The four core, north, south, east, west. Yeah. Uh, the earth. idea of a home. I thought it stood for earth. What's that? I thought it stood for earth. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It actually translates a little like the four corners of earth. We think north, south, east, west. Yes, it stands for earth. But in the in the idea of this fourness or the, within the earth, you can get the idea of house and family and all that idea is in four. But you take the new beginnings along with this, they get you to 12. What's 12 stand for? Religious perfection. Religious perfection and? Governmental. That's right. That's why you had the 12. Very good, George. That's why you have the 12 tribes of Israel that represents government. And that's why you have the 12 apostles that represent religion. And here you have all these numbers playing out in this storyline. But you're going to see further down the storyline. So I knew it would give us some time. I came prepared. Chris, can I put you to work? Because when we get to verse 23, it's setting the stage, it set the stage for us for understanding the family background of the brother of Abraham. Nahor. So, as we get into chapter 23, Thank you. we're going to see another first. We saw the first Aruma, the word concubine being used. That was never been calculated. No one's been hung on them yet, that terminology. And in verse 1 of chapter 23, did, did you get yourself one? Yeah, okay. So it says, Sarah lived 127 years. It's a long time. Yeah. Huh? Mm -hmm. well, remember, she was 90 when she got pregnant. Yeah. Huh? But what's amazing about this, she's the only woman that her age is told in the Bible. No other woman. It says they died at so and so, only Sarah. All the men are told like that. God gave an honor to Sarah. And in acknowledging that, that's not been given to any other woman. Wow. Yeah, I didn't 
Yeah. yeah. So, Sarah was the only woman in the Bible whose age at death is recorded. Hmm. And it gives us some insight. Who's got a Bible? I already picked on Jackie. I'm picking on somebody else. George, okay. You look up Isaiah 51, 1 and 2. Kyle, 1 Peter 3, 3 through 6. So, she was, very, she was highly regarded woman. Now, we live in a time period, and you tell them this has been going on for a while, and I always get myself in trouble, but I don't mean to, because we live in a, a, a religious era. What did I do with my race? Oh, the Okay. There are those that teach and have been taught for a long time that bring out ink here. Mary should be worshipped. That's what my wife says. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a different, that's a different uh, conversation. Yeah. This whole idea. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Mm -hmm. You heard that? Yeah. yeah. There's nothing in here that exalts Mary at all. Now, she is a woman who's exalted. She, yes, God chose her. She has a special place. But never should she be worshipped. Nor are you prayed to. And yet in the line of this, the reason why I'm taking a moment to do this, because this is done all the time. There's verses in the Bible, what you guys are getting ready to read, that brings a mention, mention not to Mary, but to Sarah. That's a little amazing, isn't it? Isaiah 51, 1 and 2. Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness. You who seek the Lord... Look to the rock from which you were hewn, mm -hmm. and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bore you. Mm -hmm. For I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. Amazing, isn't it? Do you see in the family line? We don't think of it this way, but we could. Jackie, can I get you to do me a favor and go get my other, it's in my mailbox. I know you know where to go. Thank you. Um, if you take us one step further, you have Isaac and Rebecca. Camera, huh? Camera show. Huh? Huh? Isaac and Rebecca. And their children were? Who was the next one down? Abraham, Isaac, and? Jacob. Jacob. Uh -huh. So you have Esau, which got X out, right? And Jacob. We talked about him from the deceiver. His name was changed to Israel. And Israel represents the body of believers. All the huh? Old New Testament. So we don't think of ourselves as Jewish, but you are. You're a messianic Jew by adoption. <laughs> yeah, you are. Some say, oh no, I'm not. Oh, you better be. <laughs> yeah, you are. So from Israel you have the children of God. We're the wild branch, right? We're the, that's right, the wild branch that was grafted in. Very, very good. Yeah. And the children of God, okay? That's all of us. We represent that. In that sense, and the thing that ties us to the idea of what she was talking about, Abraham and Sarah, that red. Because through him, all the world's going to be blessed, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Through his line, through his seed, 
Right? So you can literally say that Isaac and Rebecca are the grandparents to the children of God. You with me how I came to that conclusion? Yeah. Huh? Because the children of Israel, as their son, huh? the children of Israel, that's where the twelve tribes come from, and we are grafted into that whole that whole picture. So that makes us in that same family is the idea that there's the picture there is like the parents of this whole thing. Or in this case, the great grandparents, one. We don't think of it like that. But that storyline is there in the story. First Peter 3, 3 through 6. That's you, Kyle. Yeah. Okay. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair or wearing the gold or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in formal, former times, the holy woman who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. And so there it is written again in Peter's writings, this idea of a lineage of family. Hmm? And family, okay? And he talks about Sarah. And in Dorman, how she was to submit. We don't like to hear those conversations, but that submission's been, been messed up by a lot of men over the years because they read that like, when well, my wife's going to submit to me, treat him like a doormat. Yeah. That's never been God. the will of God or what we were called to do. They don't read the next they line. Don't read this as <laughs> so you love your wife as Christ loved the church. Well, he loved the church to the point he was willing to die for it, wasn't he? If you could pull that off, then you might get the respect. Yeah, and there you go. Yeah, and so, but yet in so many backgrounds for many years, it was, they, they said, I'm the head of this house, and took that and flipped it around and turned it into something that it was never supposed to be. So, but we see in that, Sarah's mentioned in both of that, in, in both of them, I found interesting. Mm -hmm. We have all this thing about, all this stuff about Mary. There's nowhere in that. But Sarah's exalted. Sarah's the one you can make a better argument for. Isn't exactly, it? and that's yeah. the point, just a little point I wanted to point out yeah. in our study tonight, okay? So, Sarah lived to be 127 years old, and these were the years of the life of Sarah. So Sarah died in Virjath Arba, that is Hebron. I'm going to come back to this. I don't want to get into those names. I'm going to save those names to last, okay? Because if I don't, I'm going to give away the punchline way too soon, okay? So we're going to come back to this. She died in the land of Canaan, and Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. This is the man of God, the man of faith, and he is at a loss. He's mourning the death of Sarah. His loss of Sarah. And there's nothing wrong with that. We should mourn the loss. Billy Graham, I don't know how you got to see some of the, they did some of the crusade stuff you know, with him dying. And on TV they had a little news, they give little glimpses of it. And I just happened to turn it on in the news and they had a little thing going on with past stuff that he did. And how he got started and all kind of that stuff. And one of the statements that he had made at one of his conventions was that there is coming a day in the future that they're going to tell you that I am dead. Don't you believe it. I'm going to be very much alive and in the presence of Jesus Christ. And he flipped that whole story on its head. So, and I'm thinking, so the day that he died, they had that, on, that little blurb on the news. And I thought, oh, the Lord could use that, you know. There's great truth in that, yeah. yeah. But we don't mourn as someone. We, it is okay to mourn. We should mourn. It's like, but we don't mourn as, as those that have no hope at all. Yeah. And that's actually, there's a scripture there. I have 1 Thessalonians 4.13. And we don't have to do that. But that's exactly what it's saying. No, the the non-believers and those that don't believe, they have no hope. We don't mourn like it's that. The same way. Yeah. It's not the same way. You can almost celebrate too, at the same time. That's what I want my servant. I want my funeral to be a celebration. Huh? Yeah, it, should, it, should, it, should, it should somewhat be. 
I mean, we, you mourn because you, you love the person you are. Right, there's a loss there, yeah. Right. Yeah, you're not mourning for the person, you're mm -hmm. mourning because you missed the person. Right? That's right, you're mourning for your loss. You're not right. mourning for no, that. No, that, that's really, yeah. that's the reality, thank you. Because that's exactly the point. Right. That mourning that we do, missing we're missing them, it's a loss. We felt empty without them. Yeah, when he yeah. passed away, Mary and I had, at first it was like, oh, it's too bad, but then we both kind of had this good feeling, like, yeah. wow, he's home. That's, yeah, that's exactly you know, right. Mary, that's exactly that's right. right. You that's don't normally same. have that, yeah. like, that feeling that yeah. quick, but it was all like in the yeah. four or five minutes. And I like how he said that, you know, if they're telling you I'm dead, don't, don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Huh? That's pretty when, good. Yeah. When my mom passed, you know, and I was there, and I said, I, you know, for, I come into it, I'm like, oh my gosh, you're gone. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, you're with Jesus. Exactly. Oh, what's happening? Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> there's a party. There's a yeah. jubilee. There's yes, a party. Exactly right. And there's a, there's yeah, a joy in that. Now, I didn't get to see this, but when my grandmother died, on my mother's side, there was, that's the, the line of faith in my family. My dad's side is very dark. And it still is very dark. I turn around, my brother says, "You have lost your mind." Yeah. <laughs> right, so, no, Do no, you know, I haven't. Boy, there's angels singing. That's great dancing. hope, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> there's this great big jubilee going on. Yeah, actually, I'm going to tell you two little stories real quick. My grandmother, um, she died in Ohio. We were living in Seattle. At the time. My mom went back to be with her, and she, she, my grandpa was a preacher, so she was a preacher's wife for many years. And a uh, great lady. And I didn't get to see her that often because we lived in Seattle and they came up a couple times, so I kind of knew her, but barely, okay. But they said a story when she was dying. She was at my uh, Aunt Dorothy's house, which is my mom's sister. She was in the bedroom and she's telling them, get me my car keys. I'm going to take a trip. And they're trying to say, Mom, you're not, get me my car keys. So she's getting upset with them. So my mom says, go get the car keys. They get the car keys, and Grandma sits up in bed and has those car keys, and she's jingling them. And she begins to quote, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And she fell back and died. And that was it. She knew she was going on her trip. She wanted those car keys. Huh? <laughs> wow. Yeah, she fell back and died. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's crazy, yeah. And the same thing with Bob, Linda's stepdad. Some of you, I don't know if you ever got to meet Bob. He'd been to a small group a few times when I had it before our Pastor Rod has it now in the Sunday night group. And he's been gone probably seven, eight years now. And he was a, you know, he was very sick, fine Christian man. I had the privilege of, he came to faith under our ministry in California when I pastored my first church. He was 52 years old when he came to Jesus Christ. And he thought he was dying. I remember going to the hospital, he's begging the doctor to get a preacher and there so he could get baptized because he thought if I get baptized then I'll be okay. It was all about being baptized. And I can walk it in about that point. And because uh, his daughter, it was an extra neighbor, someone that went to our church, and that was how uh, the connection was. So I went down and saw him and had the privilege of saying, it's not about getting dipped. <laughs> it's not. Actually, the line that I used, that uh, Pastor Newman, an old preacher guy from uh, back in Ohio, a kind of the Kentucky area, he used to say this, you can get baptized till the tadpoles know you by name. <laughs> but if you do not know Jesus Christ, you're not making it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I may have used that on both. To talk about that. But anyway, I had the privilege of leading him to Christ. But years later, his wife Hazel they had come to faith and she passed on, and Linda's dad passed on, and so Linda's mother and Bob ended up getting married. And, my, and this person that was one of my parishioners ended up being my father in law. <laughs> and so, in his death, and this long story, though, it's, it's, it's got a, a coolness to all of this. He, he was dying and he was in a home. Um, off of 91st Avenue, just north of uh, Bell Road. There's some homes there for people need help. And so he was living there. And before he died, he, two things happened. He had the privilege of leading a nurse's aide that came in. He led a nurse's aide to Jesus Christ before he died. It was, you know, he, 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 was, he was doing it right up to the end. And uh, 
in the process of being in that home, so much was happening. We knew he was going. He was getting ready to go to hospice. Um, his sister Janice, which was a Christian, that was highly influenced on his life as he, when he was younger. And uh, she passed away two weeks before he did. We never told him. We thought, he's got so much going on, he's so sick, there's so much happening, why just pile that on top of everything else? We didn't, hear, we didn't tell him. Tammy was there, Linda's sister, some of you have met, no Tammy. Tammy was there with him the night that he passed. She, was, she knew it was coming and she just stayed down there, slept on the couch. And he had been bedridden for the last couple weeks and he had not a whole lot of movement. Okay. Um, all of a sudden, she thought an aide had come in because the doors were unlocked, even though they had their own like, little apartment. They're like little apartments, but they came in, it was in the home, you know. And so she thought, she looks up and sees somebody at the foot of the bed. She thought an aide or worker had come in, she just didn't hear him come through the door. And all of a sudden, Bob started saying, Hallelujah! And Tammy's now, she's up, and realizing that Bob is now sitting at the foot of the bed doing this. His hands are up. Hallelujah. And he stops. Janet, is that you there with Jesus? Yeah. And we did exactly that. <laughs> we didn't tell him. But, and he died that night. He, he died. That was his last night here on earth. Mm. This is, it's, yeah, it's amazing stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, let's get back where we were. Janice, what are you doing there? Yeah, Janice, exactly. Yeah. I find that amazing. I didn't tell that in his funeral because I did. But when we did the graveside for all the family and stuff, I, I shared those, that, that story of what happened right before he passed. That's, that's powerful, isn't it? Yeah. So, Abraham's mourning Sarah and weeping for her. Then Abraham stood up from before is dead and spoke to the sons of Heth. And that's what he said. I am a foreigner and a visitor among you. Now he said that, I'm a foreigner and visitor among you, not because he was from Ur of the Chaldean, but over this time. Debbie, can I get you to look up one? Look up Hebrews 11, 8 through 10. He said, I'm a foreigner and a visitor among you, not because he came from the Ur of the Chaldeans, but he came to understand who, he was, who really did control the land and where he did truly reside. Because remember, it was all about land. And there's a funny story, you know, a thing that was a tell about this after she was, are you there? Hebrew yeah. 11, 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and went out to the place where he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that, was, that, ha that has foundations, whose architect, builder, is God. Some of your versions say, and whose builder and maker is God. Is God. Architect and builder. Yeah, the same thing. Yeah. So this is the right word. I like the architect yeah. because yeah. he designed it. Yeah. <laughs> so he knew that he didn't own it, huh? All this land they're fighting over, and they're still fighting over it all belongs to God. And Abraham is now looking for the city. I'm going, he's sending me to a city, and he's going to give a land, and we're going to have this key, and, and all that Israel represents. But Abraham is now looking way past all of that for the city whose builder and maker is God. That's, that's good stuff. Huh? Mm -hmm. And so also what you see in this, as, as we're moving down to this, as we're going through this, in verses 10 through 16, and I'll go ahead and read that right here. Then the servant took ten of his master's camel. Oh, no, wrong, wrong one. I'm going to head. Ten through sixteen. Okay. Now Ephraim dwelt among the sons of Heth. And Ephraim the Hittite answered Abraham in the presence of the sons of Heth, all who entered at the gates of the, his city, saying, No, my lord, hear me. I give you the field and the cave that is 
is in it. I give it to you in the presence of the sons of my people. I give it to you. Bury your dead. Then Abraham bowed himself down before the people of the land and spoke to Ephraim in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, If you will give it, please hear me. I will give you money for the field and take it from me, and I will bury my dead there. And Ephraim answered and saying to him, My Lord, listen to me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? So bury your dead. And Abraham listened to Ephraim, and, Ephraim, and Abraham weighed out the silver for Ephron, which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, currency of the merchants. Now there's a little story playing, a game playing out here that's foreign to us, that it was very common in that day. Because everybody was wanting to look, up, look good, everybody was wanting to make sure they did the right thing and had the right thing. So. When someone's trying to sell something, the first part of the negotiation was, I'm going to offer it to you as a free gift. Now you say, yeah, I'll take it. You're going to be a marked person in that culture. Ah, oh, he's a taker. Did you see that? Did you see how he did that? You're supposed to say, no, no, I don't want that free gift. So this little game is a part. Have you ever been to Mexico and negotiated over a trinket or something down there? Oh, it's yeah. kind of like that. It, it's kind of that same kind of idea while you're watching that play out like that that's going on in that storyline. So because had he just said, yeah, okay, I'll take it. No. Now he's marked as a bad person. Yeah. So his reputation is now ruined. Yeah, I noticed how he slyly put in the price. Exactly right. And that price is high. Okay, and some there's two reasons. Some she's thinking that Ephraim was making making a buck on this thing. Okay, huh? He was really wanting to make a buck. And then there's another reason why they say that it's that way. Okay, so we're we're going to get into that. We've got a few. I'm going to push this to get through the rest of it. We're almost done, but I want to I want to do this tonight. So that negotiation is going on. This back and forth. And then Abraham, when he put that price out there, and Abraham knew, oh, that's a high price, but you know what? I want that land. God directed him to a specific place of land, just like he did where he took him, where he took, he took his son to um, sacrifice him. Same thing going on here, in, on this particular land. And so, we see that this negotiation is played out. Ephron's name is doubly fruitful. We're going to see some plays that were doubly fruitful. I think he did get double fruitful just by selling it for the foreigner shackles. Eh? Yeah, you, you, you got some story, you got some things going on here, okay? Yeah. That's what his name means. And he carefully slipped in this price to be able to do that. Abraham buys the field and buries, they're going to bury Sarah there. So Abraham, in the verse, next verse says, Abraham, verse 9, said, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah. The definition of Machpelah is the cave of double tombs. So you have the man that's doubly fruitful selling the land that has the cave of double tombs. Now there's a story that's not in the Bible, but it, it is an ancient uh, writings of the rabbis and this is why some believe he used that price because he knew this okay that land was a special place and in the story which we cannot prove but there is the story that the rabbis say, say that in this place well, we'll just read it we'll just do that okay so the definition of Machpelah is cave of the double tombs we know Sarah was buried there, and Abraham is also buried. Genesis 25, 9, but we're going to see it again. Jackie, can I get you to do one, do one more for me? Yeah. Genesis 40, we're going to do this in the future. All these ones I'm reading, we're going to get to them in the future. They're all in Genesis, as you see. This one is going to cover Genesis 49 and 31, and I want you to stay there because I want you to jump to the next chapter and read another verse for me. So, we know in Genesis 25, and, that, and what it talks about in Genesis 25, 9, why I wanted to put that, because it's all in the one verse she's getting ready to read. You don't have to do it. But what I find amazing when it says in Genesis 25, 9, it says that Ishmael and Isaac buried their father 
there. There was a coming together for a moment between those two brothers. At least to bury their dad. And it gives us the yeah, little glimpse of it. Again, huh? no, that that we, was probably the last time that those two groups got together. It probably was. They didn't but, fight. And didn't <laughs> fight, yeah. They buried the dead. It's, it's this little work that we, we just read past it, don't think about it. But there's a lot there in that yeah. storyline of all that's going on and all that's happened. And, yeah, he probably sold it to Ishmael, too. Yeah. <laughs> and so, here we go. Now, his, but we know that he's buried there, okay? Isaac and Rebecca were both buried here. And Jacob buried Leah there. Okay, go ahead and read it, Jackie. 4931. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. Read it again for me. There they buried Abraham and Sarah his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah his wife. And there I buried Leah. Husbands and wives buried in the, the tomb or the cave of double tombs. And Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, and Jacob and Leah. Now I find it amazing it's just Leah there, not Rachel. Because yeah. Rachel was the wife he loved, but Leah is the one that produced more children of the tribe. Yeah, the first, it was his first wife. Yeah. And it was his first wife. Yeah. But the other one isn't ever mentioned as a concubine. Yeah. Huh? It's, Rachel literally was, in the define of what we define, Rachel was our comfortable wife. Yeah, because she was second wife. She was second wife. That was a part of that whole... Where was she buried? Or? We don't yeah, never but, no, no, no. but I find that amazing. So you have this going, okay? So, the place of the double tombs. This, is, this place is the great tomb of all the patriarchs, isn't it? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All buried in the same place. In Hebron. Yeah, okay. That's why I saved Hebron. Didn't want to do in verse 2 all the definition of what that meant. And we're going to use, do this in close, okay? And there's a story that the ancient rabbis tell. I haven't said, talked about that yet. Hebron is a city in Canaan, which originally was named Kerjath Arba. And what's, here it is. This city was, was named Kerjath Arba, which means... The city of four. That's a funny name, isn't it? Hebron. The city of four. One, two, three. Who's four? The ancient rabbis teach before any of them was buried here, and why that place was so uh, worth that much money. It's because it is the place where Adam and Eve are also buried before. Can you prove that? No. But I find it interesting that that's written in history like that. These three are there. Well, that would make sense. This we don't know, but the city was named after the city of four, and the reason why is because the reason why God moved him and had him by that place, because it's the place where Adam and Eve were buried. The first couple. Something to just think about. We can't prove it, we can't know, but I find that amazing that's in writings that exists. And it, would make and, sense. and it makes to all the words line up to the city of four. Yeah. Something to think about. Okay? Well, and then that was the be God's beginning of his plan, and then this was the beginning of salvation. And exactly. I mean, there's there's so much here to this, even in the numbers and in all the stuff yeah. that we've talked about. Yeah, it does fit. Uh -huh. Interesting. Uh -huh. So. They all got buried there. This plot. Now, think about this. Remember God made a promise to them? All this land, Canaan's going to be yours. Mm -hmm. All this land is where it's going to be, and that's still waiting for all that to play out. Right. You know, they still don't have all the land. They only have a sliver of it. All the land that was a part of Palestine, to make that be, would you have to take part of a little bit of Syria, or they take a little bit of what's, where Egypt has. All of Jordan, I don't know if you've ever seen that map, all of Jordan, that was Palestine. 
that should be given to the Jews. And it was never a country, it was a region. So here we end with the story. God's promised them all this land. Now he knows he don't own any of it. We've already established that. He don't own any of it. And he's looking for the city whose builder and maker is God. And yet, upon the death of all of them, they own this cave. This graveyard, if you would, is owned by Abraham and his family. All the Canaan promised that well, he, he owns the graveyard. That used to be a joke I used to tell. <laughs> yeah. My parents had great plus here. And they moved to Ohio. Excuse me, they moved to, back to Michigan. And uh, this little town they moved in never heard of such a thing. You buy a house in the little city of Coleman, and you get a, a plot in the graveyard for free. Yeah. yeah. You buy a house, you get plots. So they had the they had plots out here, and they said, "Son, we're not coming back." Actually, my dad's buried in Michigan in that one of the plots, and my mom's gonna she's not ever gonna leave there because she's gonna go right next to it. And uh, so we got the plots, and so I paid him a little bit for them and uh, helped them out, and it helped us, and so they're paid. So the joke was, "Hey, the only thing I didn't know that I got paid for is the in the grave part over there." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and Abraham's in that same place. All this promise is going to be his, and what do they own? Plots in the graveyard. Yeah, I find that interesting. Hope you got something out of that, okay? Let's leave it there. Let's close in the word. Here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the conversations and the insight that you give us, Lord, into this story and how it moves forward, the story of faith and the family of faith. And so, Father, we... We thank you for this time together, and we just pray that you'd be with us, lead, guide, and direct, direct us, Lord, and use us, Lord, to bring glory to your name. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. 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 Good conversation. And then go back to...